Welcome everyone to Rob. I think I know most of you. If you don't know, I've got that data that we can sign up here to do the wedding laws. We recognize that California State University San Bernardino sits on the territory of the federal land of the San Manuel Band of Mission Indians. We recognize that every member of the California State University San Bernardino community has benefited and continues to benefit from the use of the occupation of this land since the institution founding in 1965. Consistent with our value of community and diversity, we have a responsibility to acknowledge and make visible the university's relationship with Native peoples. By offering this land acknowledgement, we affirm Indigenous sovereignty and will work to hold California State University San Bernardino more accountable to the needs of the American Indian and Indigenous people. Great, thank you, Gus. And thank you to our distinguished guests who are here this evening. Um, and we're pleased to be having this conversation this evening in conjunction with Francis Eleanor of the Exhibition and Themes. We are also honored to have Janelle Brand, who has agreed to join us this evening. Janelle is a film curator, program, program educator, art administrator who is based in Los Angeles. She's a board member of the program, program for Los Angeles Film Forum and faculty of the California Institute of the Arts, and also a career of film editor. Her interest around uh, her pro practice creates frameworks to explore the balance of black life and experimental and non fiction film with a special interest in sonic film, local film, media, and Caribbean film and video. These impressive accomplishments and Brown's specific interests make her an ideal co-conversant with the USB of Francis Amandaro's, himself an internationally recognized speaker of still in moving images, and whose work is featured in Rathlin's main gallery. The installation of Rhythm Pleasure, pleasure utilizes video and audio, gathering on cell door and on the wrist, Locations connected to his own family's migrations to create a visual and oral experience for the viewer. This approach utilizes video and photography based on personal experience to draw together the personal and the political to lead to ultimately the poetic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thanks for <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me here. Yeah, thank you for. Yeah, I'm still at the point, I guess, in my career where I'm like, oh, how how did you hear about me? Because I still, yeah, I feel like I, you know, I'm just kind of in my own little bubble and um, I'm not, it's very interesting just to think about how our work circulates and how mm. we might be, there might be all these resonances and all these people that we're looking at observing from afar, but we're meeting for the first time and, you know, getting into direct contact in the first time. So I just really value the invitation, being able to meet you. And we've already discovered some overlaps in like our lives. So yeah, I'm just happy to be in conversation with you. Um, so, you know, I think I just want to start off by some observations or maybe kind of thinking about the framework in which um, seems exists. Um, one, just on a very basic level, this kind of eight channel work, that's just very impressive, very interesting. And in reading about reading your bio and your interests and thinking about the kind of different ways you're interested in the durational, the performative um, images and the different ways that they're mediated and circulate, you know, just to have this is, I think, very fascinating. And there's a lot that we can kind of peel back about that. So we're definitely going to spend some time talking about that. But one, it's just kind of this rich, you called it chaotic, it's chaotic, but it's also rich. And it's, those are all good and complicated and amazing things. And I think um, really there's so, so much richness in how someone can just walk through, navigate and experience the work. So congrats on the exhibition and, and the work period. Um, I think one of the things which um, kind of led you um, to inviting me is around um, some of our own personal identities, our diasporic identities. And so you have this line in the write-up about rhythm and pleasure, which is the eight channel work in which, and I'm kind of paraphrasing, uh, you want to unpack the legacies and histories of exploitation, precarity, and employment, homelessness, dislocation, and debt specifically to dias diasporic communities. And then, you know, so with this word or this 
concept of seams where two edges meet um, in which complex images and ideas meet. It's really so fascinating to think of this space and, and you know, we'll talk, I'll, I'll wanna ask you more about how you were traveling and kind of situating yourself as a diasporic person traveling around Honduras and El Salvador making this work. But in general, I really, the space of Central America and the Caribbean and the complexity that's embedded in these different countries, I don't, I feel like it's not as acknowledged as much. Like even when I saw I'm Jamaican American, sorry, Jamaican American. And I think just as one point of example, I don't think people realize how multiracial of a like society that is. Like it's nominally a black country, sure. Um, but there's different uh, Chinese, Indian, Lebanese communities and different kind of power that's, you know, um, dispersed and mediated in different ways. And, um, you know, some of the other things I, I was thinking about is, you know, so the co the kind of multiracial complexity of the spaces that you're navigating through and how that conditions different relationships to labor, to land and to water, but how that's particular to Central America, the Caribbean and the Americas at large mm -hmm. and how, you know, these different and varied relationships to land, to water, uh, some of these could be embodied aspects, which kind of condition live experiences. Like even I think about how a lot of people in my family don't know how to swim um, because of the way that beaches are inaccessible to the public. Right now, there's legislation that's going through uh, the Jamaican legislature about like the one last place, which I think is near where, where Bob Marley grew up, like there's only one kind of main place in Jamaica where there's like categorically like a public access to, to the water. And so you see that in the way that like my mom and a lot of my aunts and uncles don't know how to swim, but just as an example. So, you know, there's embodied aspects of relationship to land and water, but also how that conditions relationship to industry, capital and labor. And I think we, we see so much of this in some of the things that we get in your work and just the complicated histories around the things I mentioned. So of course we have this eight channel work where people are living, they're in domestic spaces, they're cooking, they're dancing, they're being, and there's so much localized in those spaces. But then we also get <clears throat> the denim series, which I want to hear more about here. I have you talk more about later in which there, it, you know, we get jeans, we get clothes, we get these things that are, that are built upon kind of complex net networks of labor in front of us that feel like we want to reach out and touch them, but that's also conditioned in a certain way, which we're going to talk about. But then we also get them printed on tarps in the wall, which, you know, using material in that way and that specific material of, of tarp is also so interesting. So this is just kind of, you know, contextually my experience and some of the richness and dynamism that I find in your work. So just thank you and congrats again, Francis. Um, but to that point, I do want to start off by talking about rhythm and pleasure. Again, it's eight channel and there's all this technical stuff we want to talk about. But for you, I want to start maybe to hear a little bit about in a more general sense, like where that project came from, where you were maybe just as a person, your identity, diasporically, all these different things. And also as an artist, mm -hmm. like where were you when you decided to make this work? Where did it come from? And then maybe we can talk a bit more about how you made it and how you kind of your internal rubric right. for like being a diasporic citizen ethically and, and different right. things. So yeah, let's just start by where it came from, what you were up to, what you were thinking when you wanted to make that work. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. That was, a, that was a lot there, but, uh, but that's specifically why I wanted to speak with you because you, you're coming with a deep understanding of the history of this region and also like a lived experience that I think is really important and often gets kind of overlooked. And I think for me, the importance of making this work was, was um, bringing attention to that, to that lived experience, to the fact that this region does exist, these communities do exist. And I feel like the work in the end, even though initially that was not the idea, but, um, you know, in retrospect, I think it is, uh, it speaks for itself as a way of like making a stake that these communities do exist and they are thriving without like um, 
in spite of all the you know history of colonization and enslavement, all of that, in spite of the imperialist you know U.S. policies for centuries, um, you know these communities are thriving, right? And and in the time frame that I started working on this, um, there was a lot of buzz in the news about this caravan from Central America, right? Um, and always um, negatively depicting uh, these communities, the migrants, migrant workers, women in particular. Um, and and so I really just wanted to counter those images, especially um, having lived those experiences of like prejudice and of racism um and and on the other hand also not not learning about my own communities my own familial cultural histories um and that completely being erased um from school right and so there is this absence of information and i think that's part of what's be what's taken advantage of in especially in the context of the u.s um there is this whole lack, this, there's this whole erasure and lack of understanding and, and also a little bit of empathy, right, for um, why people even want to come migrate north, mm -hmm. right, looking for, in search of a better life, in search of employment, right? It's not, it's not that they want to come and invade us or like steal our benefits or whatever. It's like, it's like the last option, right? And so, um, and even for, in the case of my family on both sides, like they came seeking for opportunity and fleeing violence of some sort. Uh, and so it's not by choice, it's out of necessity, right? And so I really wanted to, I was really sitting with that and what does that mean, especially at that point, like being displaced or di dislocated from LA because in the market crash, my father lost his house, my grandmother lost her house. We were, you know, squatting essentially. And so uh, we were all, we, it's not the same as like seeing one country to go to another country. Like I just went from California to Texas, but it's still a uh, displacement. There is still uh, an uprooting, right? And so um, going back to the way that you described the work, I thought it was really important to think about and try to integrate um, the necessity for, for mobility, right? And especially having experienced it on some degree, a, a lesser degree, but you know, still experiencing um, displacement and how that displacement is not, is in, some, in many ways an inherited um, history, mm -hmm. right? An inherited history that we're not even fully under, comprehended yet because it's so, it's such a violent thing. And oftentimes like we have to suppress that or our ancestors have to suppress those stories in order to just survive, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so it was really important for me to just untangle that or unpack it, whatever, you know, just start unpacking that and trying to make sense of it. Um, and for some time, it, I, when I started the work, I was living in Houston mm -hmm. and I, and I, um, I had worked at like on an assembly line for Toshiba for, for a probationary period. And I was just about to become full times with benefits when they let go of all of us because they didn't want to give us health care mm -hmm. <laughs> insurance. And so I was unemployed again. Yeah. And so that I, you know, I started looking for work and it was very difficult, you know, post um, recession or during the recession, um, the last one, I should say. And and so I, I needed to do something with my time. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to take advantage and go back to not go back, but go visit my grandmother because she's she decided to go back. And I've been telling her I'm going to go visit. And when I went to visit, um, I stayed for like about four months and I went with no agenda. But I did take like a point and shoot digital camera. And I knew I needed to take this time to really think how am I? How am I going to move forward? What am I going to do with, you know, at this point or at this juncture? And what I did was with my grandmother, we retraced her um, path of migration. Essentially, we went to her birthplace in El Salvador and different um, other locations in Nicaragua and also in Honduras in the south. And while I was there, I also reconnected with my paternal grandfather who was living in the north part of Honduras in San Pedro Sula. And so I also took the opportunity to go visit him and and learn about his experience. Um, and in that in that uh, period of four or five months, I really got to meet family members for the first time or re meet some of them. Because the last time I had gone, I was 
uh, very young. Mm -hmm. So um, they remembered me, but I didn't necessarily yeah. remember them. And so it was it was a very like touching and very joyful experience, uh, but also a very emotional one uh, just to like learn, um, learn about our family history and what caused them to migrate because essentially they also migrated from El Salvador to different parts of Honduras or to Nicaragua mm -hmm. um, for different reasons, but always following labor, right? Like mm -hmm. search of labor and search of opportunity. Uh, and I also learned that my grandfather, like actually, which is my last name, Alventar, is like he t adopted that name as a way to kind of um, enter that country. And mm -hmm. this was not known for many years until after his death. And so I, you know, it's a lot of uncovering yeah. and, and how do you like synthesize all of that or digest all of that. Um, but yeah, the work became like the first, the first time was really about just learning, learning, learning about my family, learning about place, learning about the history. I did take some footage, but it was mostly um, the, the camera for me was a way of like note taking or journaling. Yeah, yeah. So not necessarily with any particular agenda or or knowing how I would use this. It was just, you know, observational. Yeah. Um, and so when I went, I, I came back, I went to grad school, fast forward, you know, and then in grad school, I started like thinking about what um, what this what all this footage um, means to me. And, and I really started like you know, digging through it. Um, and I realized like that a majority of the footage was of people working in some mm -hmm. way, shape or form. And what does that say about my community that supposedly they're like in the US context, they're the lazy, you know, moochers. And and so it's like total opposite. Like mm -hmm. um, my in my experience in Central America, like people wake up very early to go to work. Um, they're proud of what they do. Uh, and oftentimes it's like working with their hands, crafts, um, physically intensive labor, all, you know, and so it's not, it's not like my experience here, like, you know, working retail, not to, not to like discount that kind of labor. Um, but it's very different from like very intensive, physically intensive manual yeah. labor, yeah, yeah. toiling in the sun, you know? And so, um, yeah, I just really started thinking about that. And oftentimes, like, the type of labor was really um, gendered and mm -hmm. racialized. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking about that, especially in the context of a grad school where you have the time and space to, like, really sit with with um, the work and think about it and have discussions around it. Um, and I did get pushed back, and, you know, and I was in a different context, you know, in this is in London. Yeah, and it's a whole different. So it's a whole different uh, approach to education. Um, than it is in the in the U.S. Um, and so there was some pushback, but there was also support. Um, again, there was this lack of understanding or uh, of the history or knowing of the history. So there's always th that seems to be recurring, you know. And so you find ways as mm -hmm. an artist to work around that. Uh, but what I did find that was um, helpful was to think about ways to not um, speak what I'm trying to what I'm trying to communicate through the work like in the past like other works were like very narrative driven uh, oftentimes I'm using my own voice like a voiceover and so how can I um, begin to explore kind of mo moving away from that or building on that or expanding and so the work for me uh, I felt like spoke for itself and there was no need for like a narrative or for voiceover and so that for me was new territory and I think okay. as I accumulated well I realized that I didn't have enough if that was going to be the way to move forward like I didn't have enough mm -hmm. and so I would need to go back okay. and, and 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 that came you know years later after many rejections and mm -hmm. grants uh, mm -hmm. things like that but when I finally found the funding um, I was able to uh, go back uh, with the proper equipment, with a team, and my team is my mom and my brother mm. and my grandmother. Um, and so we were able to go back and this time around, like I knew what I was looking for yeah. and, and I, it was much easier because I have I had already been in conversation with um, everyone that was in the video or most people that were in the video. Mm. Um, and I didn't go like ask, hey, can I, you know, I still spent time there. And in explaining what I was doing, more the work kind of spread and more and more people wanted to be participants or contribute in some way. Mm -hmm. And so the 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 work kind of like opened up 
on its own and kind of like organically just unravel before my eyes. And I, at the time when I was shooting, um, I still didn't know what I was going to, how it would like come together and what it would it be a film or what it, I didn't know. And then it wasn't until I returned back to uh, Texas in San Antonio, where I was doing the residency that um, commissioned the work that I finally got again to sit with the work and then I decided like what's the best way forward and I felt that that approach of multi-channel um, would be a great opportunity to kind of show the plurality pl plurality but also like because um, the way that I think of it and the way that I edit is is I, I have a music background like K through 12 I played music okay and so I think of it like in musical terms I think of like a, a, a chorus or some sort of like orchestra where each instrument has a voice and so the so, channel is kind of like each instrument or yeah or like audio channel yeah oh, yeah exactly okay. exactly and so that's the way that i arranged it and that's the way that i edited there's moments where um only one voice is has a solo and yeah. everyone else is quiet yeah. and then it reverses so and also the way that it's displayed um is choreographic like because i didn't i work with what i have i didn't mm -hmm. have um the technology to make it all sync up. And so, you know, how do you improvise based on what you have? And so what I did was, okay, um, I'm gonna turn this in this particular order. So it, it has to be turned on in a very specific order. Okay. And so it's choreographic in that sense where, okay. um, and especially when you get to parts that are much more musical, mm -hmm. um, you start seeing like repetition, you start seeing things move across. Mm. Um, and and so yeah, that's the best mm -hmm. way to kind of describe yeah. how I'm thinking about it. It's like yeah. in a musical kind yeah. of way. And the way you just kind of described it now, learning about the choreographed nature of the installation, it it almost extends the kind of like time based text of what it is. Like it's not mm -hmm. just like something that's on a loop, you know. There's a there's a specific timing and that timing impacts like every other channel, which makes it really right. fascinating. Right. So intricate. Right. And it can fall out of sync if, you know, and, and then what happens? Because that does happen yeah. sometimes. Like if it's not turned on in a specific order or, yeah. or there's a lag in turning one mm -hmm. particular monitor on. So but there's I think there's room for that. And I think yeah. that, that then creates staggers or like mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it allows you to think about time in a different way. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I'm interested in that. And mm -hmm. I'm interested in the playing with linearity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I hope that the, that's coming across. Yeah. <laughs> well, also means that because there's always going to be a lag. There's always going to be, you know, right. we all have our human error. So there's going to be a day where it might not be synced. So someone left mm -hmm. with a completely different experience, right. which I think is, a, you know, there's beauty in that. And so, you know, maybe more so, so in terms of, so it, we, you and I were talking about it a little bit earlier. So here we have it installed adjacent side by side. Someone can sit down, look, you kind of like focus, but you're still able to see it all. When it was commissioned, mm -hmm. you were telling me that it was opposite. So people had to choose. To the side. And so, you know, I'm really just interested in why you shifted from this opposite the kind of opposite installation on opposing walls to something where it's adjacent. And so people are going to experience it in a different way. And it's going to impact the durational aspect and how long people are here and how they choose to focus and how they engage with the images. Why did you right. shift from that way to this way? Right. Right. Uh, so the first answer is like practicality mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the um, shape of the space mm -hmm. has, has a lot to, to do with that. Uh, but, how, but, the way I like to go into an exhibition is like th there are things you can change and there are things that you cannot change. Mm -hmm. So how do you work around that? How do you then um, kind of, you know, bend to the space or like conform to the space or. Uh, and so for me, I felt like that would be we, we were considering other other possibilities mm -hmm. like a corner. And in a, a different time, I have done the corner, mm -hmm. but I since I had done it before, I didn't want, I wasn't leaning towards that. So I, I when the idea for it to be adjacent with the walkway in between, mm -hmm. I, I really considered that. And, and, um, and it's less harsh in, uh, compared to the first time where you had to choose a side. I, I think that still is happening a bit, but it's less so less, 
um because you can sit in the middle right mm-hmm, <laughs> and mm-hmm. and kind of like wiggle oh, back, yeah, and forth. back and forth um so it's not making you choose you know one side over the other as um yeah i don't know i think i think there's still flexibility yeah and i like the flexibility um and yeah i think seeing it like that also make for me at least now seeing it this way like reminded me of like assembly line oh okay yeah and, yeah, yeah yeah and um I don't know that was weird like a weird took me back to my job yeah <laughs> but but I don't think that's a bad thing to to kind of like take you there mm-hmm. um, uh, but also like the way like you go to Costco and you have these whatever they're selling on like um, platform oh, yeah. on pallets yeah 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 so I think part of that part of it is also like referencing those kinds of like sites of exchange of, of commerce mm-hmm. um and and I you know just kind of pulling from those visuals mm-hmm. and and how can that be um, adopted in the work to mm-hmm. to um, reference those or connect the work to those networks mm-hmm. of finance and economics mm-hmm. and trade so on and so forth. Yeah, mm-hmm. that they're not kind of compartmentalized. You have to think about the ways that you're implicated as a consumer or the extractive right. ways that were implicated, which I think is so interesting with the denim series, even just like seeing the brands. Wrangler was like the only brand I recognized, but just mm-hmm. like as soon as I saw Wrangler, I thought of the the kind of the the aesthetic and kind of like almost like visual rhetoric that they're like branding and marketing takes yeah. on the whole Americana thing. Cause as soon as I see Wrangler, I'm like the iconicity of it is so strong. Mm. I think of manifest. I think of manifest destiny. Yeah, I think of West, I think of westward expansion. Like all oh, the, great. it's interesting how that works. Um, well, I'm glad to hear that because yeah. I struggle. I've struggled with that work. Just mm. getting um, folks interested in it because um, hmm. I, I feel sometimes I feel like it's very it's too minimal. It's too too simplistic. But at the same time, I have to like no no. It's not like I think it's. You're signaling le- something. Yeah, You're very clearly it's like, signaling. Something. And this other way that it's not as I guess loud or mm-hmm. or um, I feel like it, a good word would be like poignant because for me also like the lack of a body like mm-hmm. for me is kind of because this was done also during COVID like mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of loss and we were all like you know grieving mm-hmm. in some way and so for me also very emotional in that yeah sense. yeah um but i'm glad that you took it to, to or for you that you read like westward expansion that kind of because it's very much there and i think it's very much in the language and the pr sales language that is mm-hmm. you know strategically used mm-hmm. to to sell these products and not just denim but i would Everywhere. say all products yeah, yeah. yeah but it's very for me it was very apparent in well, not so apparent. It took me a while. I, I've been working with denim as a material for some time now. Um, but and but the more time I spend with it, the more I realize like these the language, the seams, all of these mm-hmm. all of these things that I'm making connections with. And and it so it wasn't always apparent, but now I can't unsee it. And uh, the language, uh, denizen, for example, rugged, like rugged mm-hmm. individualism. Mm-hmm. Or, so all of these words are like keywords for me. It's like it's like uh, and that's why I incorporate them into the titles, because it becomes another way to kind of um, or twist mm-hmm. um, the way um, advertising and specifically language or marketing language is used. But how can I then reclaim that for artistic mm-hmm. purposes mm-hmm. or or. Um, you know, way to kind of set a framework or, or or reframe these images and get you to think about not just the image, but also the language that's mm-hmm. used for mm-hmm. for selling mm-hmm. these ideas. Maybe we can kind of also yes. throw it out and see if there are any kind of words that came to mind with people walking through. Um, so we make it like less passive, um, seeing the jeans, seeing the palettes, even just all the screens that you're taking in. You can just throw anything out. We just wanted to hear. Yeah. <laughs> Put y'all on the spot. Uh, yeah. On the Ranger part. Mm. It's funny because uh, we, when I was going to the Mexico and last time we out there, Ranger is a big part of mm. the Calvary culture. Mm-hmm. But they use it more in terms of like um, 
uh, working with like the animals, mm, mm, wrangling. Like, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, but I do see a lot of parallel between like how that relationship is with Mexico and America. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how, uh, a lot of it has to do with like commercial, uh, industrialization, mm -hmm. industries, labor. Mm -hmm. Um, so and I like that you guys touched on the mm -hmm. labor and that part. And yeah. Part. That is yeah, a lot of people who like don't necessarily even live in America. Sometimes it's like seeing where mm -hmm. they're in the Um, but you know, it's a bit too critique because it's like, why? Well, is, is that the purpose that Ringer wants? You know, that people identify as it, mm -hmm. identify as a hardworking, as like you know, like rugged, and like, you know, it's, it's for those who like work in the land, like work with you know, so it's very much a, a, an interesting topic. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah and it's it's you made me think of like how it's fashionable to like associate yourself with like working class aesthetics or working aesthetics right like, have a coffee <laughs> like it's not an aesthetic for yeah. like working class it's like that's what you mm -hmm. have mm -hmm. right it's not a choice it's not, it's like it's what you literally what you have yeah, yeah but for for like on the other end of the spectrum <laughs> um for for those that can afford like a thousand dollar pair of jeans just because you know they're ripped or whatever like it's it's an aesthetic to them and 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 one that they could put on and take off at any point like it's an it's yeah it's it's there's a, there's the element of choice right and and for working class it's not or poor working class it's not a choice like it's the reality it's lived reality mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's interesting to see how that those kind of visuals kind of get co opted and. Mm -hmm. um, and use in these very other kinds of way mm -hmm. for fashion or for whatever. Mm -hmm. yeah. I sometimes see that a lot with um, organic food and how like, oh, yeah. my family, my family, most of life, they work for land so that eat to survive. And nowadays, people who live here in the US is seen as like, I, yeah. it's, like I have a garden and, and you know, it's, it's, it has to be clean, it has to be like, you know. But out uh, there, it's like they haven't seen anything that clean, but it's for survival. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. uh, we permit it. Yeah. The United States became like a, well, you have to have a certain amount of money to, to buy, you know, eggs that come from, you know, cage free. Yeah. The yeah, you, yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just watching a video on like the or. Use the word superfood and using that in the way that like quinoa and chickpeas, these are very these are staple foods in different parts of the world, but they've become kind of very bougie. You know what I mean? Like it. Yeah. I mean, we could talk for hours, y'all, <laughs> like all that stuff. And for me, I grew up like, I, you know, avocados are such a big we call it pear in Jamaica and it's kind of like the bigger avocados, but that's something that I grew up with. I didn't really like them, but now because of like the ways that my, so now avocado and buying avocados, I've started yeah. even eating avocados more separate from the kind of link to my cultural heritage, but in the way where it's like, you got to get these healthy fats and mm. how, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just very, it's very interesting how that happens and how our identity forms relative to like our families and our cultural heritage, but then how it's impacted when we go up and have some our own income, mm -hmm. but it's still like expensive. So I'm like getting less avocados than I would want. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you for that. Thank yeah, you for that. I mean, even like something as basic as pinto beans. Yeah. Like the way that price for it has skyrocketed, like, and I mean, I, any any staple especially now yeah. in this yeah you know, all the inflation like staple foods corn right like yeah corn tortillas are not the same anymore mm. so like all, all of these things have become co-opted and um and privatized right yeah the the, the markets for them have become private privatized yeah, yeah definitely definitely mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm-
So yeah, there's like variance in the G. Yeah, we were talking about it's like one thing, but there's variance. So thank you for that. Mm. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Talk about the factory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think it's interesting that we're talking about things like Red Shadow, mm -hmm. like, the jeans are, there's the people that you put for the cowboys into the jeans, but also like another signification of the factory. Like, right. I really do, like, when you're talking about how it's you know, presented it, you know, it's uh, the scale of merchandising, like the, the, the board scale of the, of the jeans and installed on the it read like an app, like a gap. Mm, mm -hmm. In the scale and the way that it was produced. Good point, yeah. In relationship to the talent. Mm -hmm. So this idea of a factory, um, even, even maybe unintentional, mm. rather than mm -hmm. the materials, mm -hmm. like a factory, you know, like labor. Mm -hmm. that kind of thing. So, yeah. That's yeah, really like yeah, and I think that's kind of the beauty of of working with Rafa and Mary and um, Gus. Like, was that in the space? Like, there was space to include other work and and creating a dialogue between the the installation and additional work um, that I had previously not even thought of as like connected. But of course, sure right? You never show like when I said. It's so funny. I think the show and I was like, I love the choice of these images of all eyes. Like, I actually never showed it with those images. I was like, whoa. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, it just felt like the first of the few words we got from the people. I don't know why. I don't know why. Mm -hmm. I like how we talk to each other. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah, I think that having them in the same space like creates new creating new dialogue is yeah has been such a great experience and and especially hearing um feedback from all of y'all and um and just help me like get over that like frustration that i had that it was separate work that it there was nothing mm. um that they were just two separate threads, but actually they're the same. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it yeah, wasn't until yeah. bringing them into the same space made me realize yeah. that. So yeah. I'm super happy for that. Yeah. Mary, it looked like you wanted to. Oh, I, I had a couple of short things. One, the train kind of left the station, but when we were talking about clothing and identification, you know, there was, you know, there was, you know, Solomon had this fascination of wearing worker overalls. Mm -hmm. It's like this super wealthy, you know, conceptual artist that kind of like to present himself or imagine himself mm -hmm. as a as a worker. Um so that was the one yeah, the one, yeah which is really complicated. Um but um or to complicated to contemplate, not contemplate but understand. Um and then I wanted to pick on some up on something that Francis said about studying in the UK and mm -hmm. kind of non-understanding of the yeah. history here. Which connects to two things that the the well, one thing I'm particularly interested in in past experience of mine. I worked with a director in the Southwest who worked primarily in the UK. And we would we were in the Southwest. And much of what we were working on dealt with these notions of manifest destiny. Which you'd be like, nobody knows what manifest destiny is. Yeah, yeah. Like, Are you yeah, yeah, like, yeah. what? Uh, and you got the job here? What? Um, oh, I forgot this is being recorded. But um, <laughs> but then it may, leads me to this other thing that I'm quite interested in, which is this notion of what we think of as you know art from the Americas or mm -hmm. what American art is. Mm -hmm. and it's like mm -hmm. it's not a bunch of European trained mm -hmm. older men painting the landscape, or um, you know, it, it's so much more complicated than that. If we really have people who are living in the Americas making work mm -hmm. contemporary artists like. You know, Francis's, you know, Francis's work is a great example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how, um, how our particular complexities as a, as, a, as a country and also as a series of country um, informs, our, informs the work of our artists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm so fascinated um, 
you know, just largely maybe other conversations, but for you studying in the UK where brown identity is South Asian identity, it's an Asian, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? So it's like in yeah. terms of the kind of canonized <laughs> identities, yeah. for me, I understand it more. I'm Jamaican. Obviously, I have a lot of family in the UK. So for me, Anglo imperialism, mm-hmm. culturally, I'm connected to that. So even though I didn't grow up there, like, I have, my, of course, I have my like U.S. frame, but I also have a frame which I understand very deeply in terms of the U.K. So I'm really interested <laughs> for you, where like yeah. the kind of dominant <laughs> identities of color, and then you're right, in, right. people aren't understanding, but it's also because there's different histories of imperialism right, right. that are, so they just focus on different things in general. Like, yeah, you, I just had a flashback to like oh no um, cards or like, informational cards where you have to pick the category like which race you're there was oh. never anything for someone yeah, Latino, yeah. like there's yeah, this that's, idea that's gonna, like, yeah. yeah yeah so you you don't is i'm not even an option on here <laughs> yeah i'm like it's what, really did you, interesting. what did you check i don't remember <laughs> okay Maybe, probably mixed race or okay like wow that, but, yeah yeah yeah. Uh, but but i remember there mm-hmm. not being an option mm-hmm. <laughs> like there is here yeah, yeah, yeah. um but yeah I, i'm gonna rephrase mm-hmm. what i said earlier or correct update um there was i did eventually find community Mm -hmm. and and perhaps um earlier when i said that they don't understand i i think um once i found community like there were other uh folks students along with me that were from other parts of the of the world but also in in southeast london there is a community yeah afro-caribbean community so i definitely found maybe they weren't in my program but Mm -hmm. they're definitely in the university and so i did find folks that could understand Mm -hmm. and could empathize Mm -hmm. and i could have conversations with Mm -hmm. um so yeah, there is definitely yeah, people there that there, understand. There. But in that program, yeah. like, and as when I said that earlier, I was referring more to like the faculty, mm-hmm. you know, because mm-hmm. unfortunately that's still very much an issue. Like yeah, yeah, faculty yeah. are primarily, <laughs> primarily white men, white males, right, and primarily painters too. Like, yeah. So um, and all my, you know, most of the faculty I've worked with have been painters, surprisingly. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, which is really interesting because I didn't turn out to be a painter. Um, so, yeah, I don't know how that happened, but that's in, no, that's actually really interesting because I mean, so when we were talking earlier, so photography is kind of the thing that got you started in art. Now we have this very significant um, moving image body of work, and so I'm interested, maybe just like. I'm interested, so you use this word, you use the word autoethnography to kind mm-hmm. of describe your approach. And I'm interested in how you arrived at that, especially thinking about the kind of complicated um, history and framework right. of ethnography for some of the communities we come from and why, like, why autoethnography, like, why that's something right. that resonates with you and how that shows up in how you approach making film and video. Yeah, no, that, that's a really great question. And uh, for I, I knew immediately, like, ethnography is not the word I want mm-hmm. to use because of its, you know, the history mm-hmm. behind it. Um, but then when I came across the book, um, Jose Esteban Munoz, who talks about autoethnography, okay, like, yeah, that's yeah. when I... Um, started adopting that term Mm -hmm. and although perhaps it may move away from that at times or maybe later on I changed my mind about how I feel about that term yeah it at the book his writing at least gave me the language to begin to use to talk about the work Mm -hmm. because prior to that I I was really lacking in language Mm -hmm. How, how do I and and especially in a place like grad school, like you need language, you need those tools mm-hmm. to really talk about your work and defend it. And so, um, you know, I'm thankful for for his work mm-hmm. um, and providing language to to help structure what yeah. I'm thinking about. And um, so autoethnographic, I think, is the best term at the moment, at mm-hmm. least, and to, to talk about because it is, you know, kind of think it is um, in a way like auto because it's about me, my yeah. personal experience, but also I feel that auto ethnography is kind of like uh, a reclaiming of of the ethnographic approach, uh, but turning it, you know, the other way around, inverting it to, mm-hmm. in some way. And so for me, I felt like that that could be at least for now used. Uh, using that word is like a reclamation of this idea of of being othered, right, mm-hmm. or being the one. Um, 
reclaiming the camera as this weapon, mm-hmm. right? As this tool for racialization, like and flipping it and mm-hmm. using it for something else that's mm-hmm. not that, right? Mm-hmm. That moves. Um, while at the same time, like, you know, building on that history and critiquing it and and f- finding ways to move forward, mm-hmm. right? So, I, I, But it's also interesting to think about, you know, the auto part, but while it's still kind of, there is still this distance that in terms of, you know, we're talking about our diasporic identity right. that we're still navigating. So I wonder how, not that you need to have this like der- fidelity to that word, but it's just interesting to think about that word in the context of you going. And the thing is, if you, if we're from the UK, we would say going back because they, 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 they talk about their <laughs> diasporic identity. They say, where are you from? Da, da, da. But you said not going back. But if we're, if you're actually from the UK, you would say going back and not apologize for it. So anyway, that's something I think about because I watch a lot of like British media, but anyway, that's an aside. Um, but like with you going, going to Central America and like, I wonder how that impacted how you shot, like when you, you talked a little bit about it, but like when you decided to take out a camera versus not. So the first trip, you're, it's like a note taking device. The second trip, you're with your mom, brother, family, that's your team. But I'm just wondering a little bit more in terms of, you know, how you felt like you were, tra- how to, how you kind of guided yourself to make sure you're doing this. Like in a way, it's clear that I'm sure there's trust and all these other things, but yeah. just so you're not replicating Right. A, a mode of extraction or an extractive relationship. Like, yeah. how did you do that? So you you felt like you weren't doing that. Right. Right. Um, there is my approach is more conversational. Mm-hmm. I start with the conversation. I start with um, uh, letting them ask, ask all the questions that they want to ask. Um, part of it is also like they're very excited. Uh, my family is very excited for me to be there and, and they it's it's as much i'm learning as much from them as they are from me so i i I think it's important to reciprocate as much as possible and especially with like youth they were so fascinated and interested in like learning the tools like using the camera like how could they use it so um it really made me think about in the future how i can uh, incorporate that a little bit more um but i think involving them in the in the process became the way for Mm -hmm. to get um folks at at ease right and and to be willing uh and open right to to express themselves and to like communicate whatever they desired um and one thing that i told them up front like if you don't you do not have to be part of this like i respect like if you don't want to um be filmed or if you don't want your face like that i'm gonna you know, defer to whatever your needs mm-hmm. are. And I think that worked out for the most part. Um, I think there was one instance in actually in Tela, Honduras, where it was in uh, in this neighborhood where it was um, Garinago community and they wanted, um, they were asking like, if, I, if I'm if i making a documentary and I'm like, no, this is not documentary. Mm-hmm. Um, and and they wanted me to do the documentary, but I didn't feel like that's my mm-hmm. role. Like that's like, I'm happy to help you if you want to make the documentary. And so like part of it is like also offering, what do they need? Yeah, like, what, yeah. what, how can I be of service to you and help you and what your vision is? Um, and and so for me, like, it, it, like I just didn't feel like I'm the right person to yeah, to yeah. do a documentary on yeah. on their stories. Like I, because it's not my That's, story to share mm-hmm. to tell, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so there was a couple instances of that yeah. um, where I had to, you know, kind of not set a different bit. expectations. Right, right, right. Like se- yeah, separate and just make make clear that what I'm doing is not a documentary um, and it's not um, it's going to circulate in a different way exactly. than like you know a cinema film yeah. or um, like a feature film yeah. like that. and so um, really just letting yeah, yeah. them know the green of everything mm-hmm. that, that's going on and at that point I didn't even know like how it would come together Um so there was a lot of like unknowns, mm-hmm. uh, but I, but I, um, 
But you did know there wasn't going to be a documentary. Like that's something. Yeah, I knew for sure. I did not want to. Yeah, that's not what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And it was later on that uh, the idea, you know, in just having conversations about the work, I realized like a workshop would be perfect. Like to then come back and Mm -hmm. um, bring uh, the camera and other like devices and. Um, have workshops in which they develop their own photographs or their own short films. And I was able to do that for El Salvador, but I still need to do that in mm. Honduras. Mm. And that's like my dream, like go to to do this with to do that along with taking the work and review, sharing it with everybody. Mm. Because when I was able to do it in El Salvador, I was able to take the take the work okay. in a single channel format. And we at, you know after at the end of the week long workshop, uh, they presented their films, and then I also presented this film, mm-hmm. and then they could see in a single channel format in the credits it has all their names, and so they they were able to like point out and see their names and uh, the different locations, uh, and so that was really neat to be able to share that experience with them. It's like a very communal mm-hmm. uh, kind of setting, and I would like to do that again in in Honduras to to kind of show. Um, what what the work ended up being, and and also like there's no end to it, like it's still in progress. In progress. Um, I don't think I've ever screened like a single channel version of it outside of El Salvador. Like that's probably the only time I've done that. But I would like to do that in in Honduras, and and you know find ways to kind of re, you know do that, replicate that with with the workshop, so yeah. that they can also contribute their. Um, their stories and and create their own films or photographs or whatever they mm. they, they want to do. Um, th- I, I hope I answered your yeah. question. Yeah, yeah, you did. And just the and the work also being in dialogue. I think a lot of times there are times where people do stuff and it just happens in this ether, and maybe people don't know how their work is circulating, and mm-hmm. especially when there's different power dynamics that are. Yeah. But for you to like put it all together in one channel, right, right, and shows the kind of collective mm-hmm. experience that was happening. I think yeah. people see what they made. Yeah, and last recently, I had a conversation with a colleague, um, with Nicole actually, um, about how it's not it, it, it's it's an, a, a nice possibility to think of the work, even though it's dated, you know, 2014, 2019, but there's this possibility that it can continue growing and expanding. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one possibility where like, um, it, it, it's another possibility for it to not just exist as an installation. Cause that's really hard to replicate yeah. for, for a number of reasons, but as a film, single channel film is easily, uh, or it's, it's able to like circulate much more easily. Mm-hmm. I think in the, in the form of the text, it's not the work, but it's the text in relationship to the work. I think that's another way for the work to kind of continue circulating. It's also on YouTube, no password. So mm-hmm. um, anyone with the link could click on it or you can search for it and you'll find it. So it lives on in these different ways. But also I like the idea of of um, it not being final. Like I, I actually can continue adding to this work if I wanted to. And what would, what would it look like if I were to go back and with a workshop and like add other members mm-hmm. of the community like their work through this work what does that look like mm-hmm. right and mm-hmm. it's less about this work and more about the their process work. and the, the relationships process, yeah. and the yeah mm-hmm. yeah yeah so it yeah it, i like this idea of not thinking of, of, of a work as finalized yeah so yeah can continue mm-hmm. So. Mm-hmm. yeah it looks like we're at time. Sorry. Are we? Okay. okay. <laughs> this has been so um, fascinating, and you already allowed for some um, contributions from the audience, but I don't know if anybody else has any, a few questions or. Okay. Yes. yes. I mean, I decided for especially when you talk about auto responders, but I'm really interested in how that term or your process. Differentiated from documentary. Mm-hmm. Yeah, documentary as something we've had this conversation where it's like way far apart from each other. We have a very raw narrative. Mm-hmm. Like, how do you do more to this process? Not because I, I think I know when you said you want to do a documentary. Yeah. Yes, there's like a formula in the way that documentaries are made. Yeah. There is such still a, there's something still. 
uh, this documentary, you're listening to it and you're happy. Mm -hmm. mm. I can see you, but yeah. I to where I can see you uh, start a documentary or how are you doing mm. yeah, yeah. documentary and relationship to practice to, to work here? Process that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm. I'm. At the end of the day, whatever language people want to use, yeah, yeah. I don't it care. Is. Like, I would. Ra I would ra rather have. Um. You know. To, let's just see the work. Let's just have the conversations. Like. Um. So that's how I feel. <laughs> but, but but it's in the past. I think it's partly like trauma from art school <laughs> and like documentary being like this sure. uh, and, and and I get part of it it's like because you're looking down right like from this position of mm -hmm. power and privilege mm -hmm. right and, and that's not what I'm trying to replicate like I want to move away from that at the same time knowing that I am coming from a position of privilege and power and like I'm educated right like and and so like but also like how do I take those layers off and or, or how do I use that in a way that's gonna not be that same power dynamic um, and I think uh, I think by opening up the process and allowing it to become more and more and this is something that I think this work was a pivotal moment because that's when I started allowing for uh, the my work to become more collaborative more communal um, incorporating um, not incorporating sorry like having my brother like help having my mom help having grandma it, it became it took a village it literally took a village and this work was like the marker of that like my ch changing or shifting of thinking and so um to come back to your question about documentary i mean if that's what you want to call it that's fine i have <laughs> Been committed to this kind of critical realism in the way, and there, there's something uh, this idea of like realism showing up. You know, I call it documentary. Mm -hmm. Um, it's interesting. Like, could would you do all of this with a narrative impulse? Like, mm -hmm. make something entirely narrative. Is it important that it's realistic, or um, that it was shot? You know, you're not casting these people. They're doing. I, those are just questions, you know, like, I'm actually going to be intrigued by your practice. Um, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, are you going to say something? I was just going to agree, but I, you, when early on when we were talking about the video, you talked about it as being uh, portraiture. Mm -hmm. And there's something involved um, in this notion of capturing a portrait where you're trying to understand or, you know, there's a, uh, engagement there that um, mm -hmm. is a little bit different uh, in terms of meeting the subject, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and it is all language. Right, right, right. Um, and, and that is another way to think of it, but, you know, it, it also comes with its own, like, history yeah it's, you know. <laughs> but uh but i think um they, they could be thought of as portraits they could be thought of as landscapes and they they could and i think that um it being to operate in any of these genres or uh for me i don't see that as a bad thing like if anything it opens up new ways of talking about the work um and perhaps looking at it from different lens and critiquing from different points of view like i'm interested in that i'm interested in the conversational part of it uh, you think that's what you were trained mostly by painters <laughs> i don't know i don't know <laughs> you were sure and then you said like, yeah let's well, say man painters oh. Yeah, but I think it's also more than it's it, it's and that's what the work itself is how the work circulates. It's like yeah. the labor, it's power, it's the way capital circulates. It's how many people are going to see it on what scale. I think what are the expectations? Because a lot of times documentary are these topical things where someone comes in and it does shine a spotlight on a cause, an issue, or a community of people. And it, that there's also a lot of expectations that are projected onto that. And that's not yeah. the scale that you're operating on. So it's also no. important to be clear about the expectations because someone might be going through a play, an environmental play, and they need someone to make a documentary, <laughs> this thing that's going to okay. travel to the film festivals and be at that. And that's not yeah. what you're doing. So oh, you, it's too imagine. personal yeah, for me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, that's not what you're it's doing. Too, it's too personal. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about how... Mm -hmm. yeah, talking about... <laughs> 
in it to stop the action from mm -hmm. directly in and this is no nah. I'm imposing my own look <laughs> but there's like a secure feeling mm -hmm. to the way that you're presenting the work and I don't know it's refreshing me in place like in this place on this coast. Oh mm -hmm. um, that was very popular in the 70s and 80s, but you know, after opting later and everything, that starts to kind of go away. You don't see a lot of it. You know, I haven't seen any of this work, and I, I don't know if it's, it's, it's a good thing. But I know you don't want to be a part of the spirit. <laughs> thank you, thank you. But, but yeah, I don't know. Any other questions? No, I was just going to say that. Okay. Say, thank you for coming. Thank you so much. Thank for you for having me. Uh, wonderful to meet you. Uh, and thank you, Francis, for everything. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>